So I did not bring any of the unicorn stickers for those of you who have DBRE, unfortunately. Um, I did bring a bunch of other stickers if you happen to like unicorns saying rude things about technology. Um, and I will put them on the table here after my talk. So if you want to wander up during lunch and get some, they don't even say honeycomb on them or anything. They're just um, rude. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can tell that I'm from ops because that's how I feel about software. The only good diff is a red diff. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a swirl of a bunch of stuff. Can y'all hear me? I'll try and not bounce around too much. You know, what is it like? Something I've been realizing working on Honeycomb is how incredibly fortunate I've been to work on pretty high performing teams. You know, unevenly, but off and on. I know what it feels like, and I have taken that for granted. There are so many people out there, like you know them, who have never gotten to work on a team that is even reasonably performing, and they don't. It's like they, they think we're lying. <laughs> it's like they can't actually conceive of the, of, of the world of engineering not being just a total slog and, and pain, like all the time. And um, you know, there's a wide range of variants, but I, this has really kind of radicalized me. I'm like, they need to know. <laughs> they need to know, they need to try it, they need to, because this is how employers get away with it. People stay at their shitty jobs, people stay at their, jobs where they're not supporting their people well <laughs> because they don't realize that they could be happier somewhere else, right? And it's up to us to hold them accountable by voting with our feet, believe that it can be better, not perfect, but better. Um, and, and like that's the easy part, honestly. The hard part is how do we get there? Because <coughs> it's like Dostoevsky's quote about how, Tolstoy's quote about how every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Kind of true of dysfunctional teams, too. It's kind of true of every team. Every single one of us, we can look at, uh, so we could say this is what it would be like to be on a great team, but then the gap between where we are and where we want to be is uncharted territory. Like, we have to figure it out from scratch using our creative brains and our collaboration and everything every time. How does a team develop a high performing practice? How do you know? Oh, and by the way, isn't this talk supposed to be about observability? <laughs> Yes, it is. It is, I swear. Why are computers hard? Because we don't understand them. Like, it is amazing how little we understand our computers. And we just keep hitting shift anyway. It's like, well, you know, I'm not going to understand it much less than I understood it yesterday, so seems legit. Also, like, honestly, we have never learned to debug with science. We have been doing this crazy thing where we've got our dashboards, We've got a lot of scar tissue and like past incidents that we've survived. And we just kind of look at the dashboard and start flipping through our mental Rolodex, Rolodex of events. Like, does it fit this? Does it fit this? Does it fit this? Does it fit this? Believe it or not, there are other ways to debug systems. <laughs> Some of them involve scientific approaches, like starting at the edge and systematically reducing the search space until you find the answer every time. Um, and vendors have really not been helpful because their traditional line here has been, just give us tens of millions of dollars and nobody will ever have to understand your system. That doesn't work. <laughs> like, it really doesn't work. It really doesn't work. And the longer you keep trying to make it work, um, the less you understand your systems and the more computers are hard. And you get why execs kind of want this abstractly. Like they want their humans to be replaceable because, you know, it, it blew my mind when I heard an executive say, well, employees come and go, but vendors are there forever. <laughs> I went, what? <sighs> Everything makes so much more sense to me now. <sighs> but like, as the people like who are, it, it, it is a, it's a beautiful dream. It is a dream that executives can have, but it is an impossible one. I don't care how much AI and ML they say that they're going to sprinkle on your systems. Somebody's got to understand it at the end of the day. And that should be you. You should want to understand it. Your life will be better if you're playing a game where you understand the rules and you know how to win than if you're just kind of like stumbling through this Kafkaesque nightmare. Kafkaesque. <laughs> that was a pun. <laughs> Accidental pun. Uh, we have science now. What does it mean to be a high-performing team? Well, thanks to Jez and Nicole, we actually have some data. 
All right, science may be stretching it, but we have data, and it's pretty good data. At least it tracks with my intuition, so that means it's probably true. Um, what they came up with said that you actually only need to track four things for your team to kind of get a feel for where you stand. How often do you deploy? How long does it take between when you, um, between when you commit the code and when it's fully live? How many of your deploys fail? And how long does it typically take you to recover from an event? And if you're an engineering manager and you're not tracking these, like, this, this should be like your priority one because um, it's leverage. <laughs> It's leverage to get to do the things that you, you know need to be done for your systems. Um, SLOs are the technical side of it, and this is the people side of it. Um, and what, what, what they found was there is a huge gap between people who, what they call elite teams, and, you know, the rest of us. Like, look at that change failure rate. <laughs> Time to restore service, elite teams, less than one hour, low performing teams, between one week and one month. <laughs> Deployment frequency. <laughs> you know, this is a sad life to live. Um, we can do better. Um, the moral of the story is, it actually really pays to be on a high performing team um, and this kind of sounds snobby, which is why I kind of don't like the term elite. I would rather say excellent. It sounds more accessible. Um, and yeah, but look at that, like 45 times more frequent code deployments. This is, and, and this is from, actually, this is from last year's DORA report. And if you, if you look at like 2019's DORA report, you actually see that the gulf widens. More and more and more teams are becoming elite and high performing. And the lower ones are just kind of like sagging a little, you know, like, there's, it, and the thing is that people think that you need to be the best engineer to be on the best teams, and that is absolutely categorically not true. In fact, it's almost anti-true. Um, true story. Uh, when Christine and I started a company, um, you know, we 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 considered going out and hiring all of our friends, you know, ex-Googlers, ex-Facebookers, whatever, because we knew them, we knew the good ones, we knew, you know, very low risk, and then we went. Eh, we say that we're here to build a tool for everyone. <laughs> that would be pretty shitty of us. Sorry, that would be very, that would not be in line with our, our, our ethics and our goals. And so we, be careful how I phrase this, because it's not like we're like, let's go hire some bad engineers. Like, that's not what we did. But we, but we intentionally like hired, you know, new Code Academy grads and people without like long resumes, just people who seem, you know, pretty bright, you know, they knew how to use Git and we were like, you seem nice. We selected very highly for uh, communication skills. In fact, um, our coding interview was just the night before, we're gonna email you something, um, extend or improve the code, you know, in these ways for about an hour and then mail it back to us. Don't, fin don't try to finish it. What does finished even mean, right? Make it better, add some functionality, send it back, whatever you got, but that's not the interview. Um, the interview is the next day when you come in and we sit there and we have a conversation about it. Like, walk me through, tell me why you did this and what else did you consider and what might you have done if you had more time and, you know, when you stopped, like, what was still in your mind, like, this is left to be done, you know? And that conversation, we told, we were very clear, the code is not the interview, the conversation is the interview. Uh, and this is the highest performing team that I have ever, ever seen. Um, it is way more higher performing than the teams I saw at Facebook. Um, and I credit that to the fact that there's a couple people there who know what high-performing teams look like. Um, there's a very good manager, who is not me, <laughs> Emily. Um, they have a lot of emotional safety. They know it's okay to take risks. There's a lot of, you know, um, mutual support. There's one on-call rotation that the entire team shares. There's a lot of solidarity. Um, nobody works more than, you know, 35, 40 hours a week. We have been, with seven engineers, we have built our storage engine and database from scratch. Um, the query planner, uh, the UI, the UX, um, all of the features that if you use Honeycomb, you may love. Um, seven engineers. Um, and that has been because um, we have had to spend very little time doing shit work. <laughs> Sorry, there's no same, there's no clean way, way to say that. It's shit work. Like, all that stuff you have to shovel your way through to get to the point where you can actually start doing the work that moves the business forward, 
That's work that shouldn't exist, right? That is a sunk cost that you pay every day. And, sorry, I'm just like ranting about my teams and interviewing now. Like, but like, we think of elite teams as being like those people. I have seen some incredibly dysfunctional teams made up of those people. Because a lot of them are out there to like show how badass they are. You know, that's not what makes a good team. <laughs> what makes a good team is people who pay attention to each other, who listen, who take it seriously, like they're conscientious about their deadlines and what they've committed to each other that they're going to do. They communicate when they're not going to make it. They ask for help. They don't feel like anybody's going to make them feel stupid if they ask for help. You know, there's none of this like, this like white knuckling of just like, you know, that, that doesn't exist, you know? They can just like, engage with the interested, curious parts of their brain and just like take off like rockets. Um, I really hate, I have a lot of very visceral anger at that myth, as, as one might expect as a um, college dropout music major who has none of the certifications that um, gatekeepers like. <laughs> when I was leaving Facebook and VCs came to me wanting to give me money, I was like, I feel morally obligated to take this money because this has never happened before in my life and it will never happen again. Excellent engineers, are, excellent teams are made with engineers who care about their work, communicate with each other, invest in incremental improvements and are empowered to do their jobs. Um, there have been a couple of times where, you know, I have been stressed about something about the company. I'm just like <clears throat> trying, how can I motivate the team to like, do extra hard work, you know, as, as we're trying to like close funding or like, you know, in the early days and I'm just like stressing a lot. And every time I realized that like, if I tried to make a game out of it or, or try to make it more fun or whatever, it wasn't, it wasn't gonna do anything. They were already so motivated to like make the team successful. The best thing I could do was just like clear space and not like, not like ooze stress all over them, <laughs> right? It's impossible, it's impossible. To, they're already motivated, right? Um, and that was kind of a weird for me to realize because I've had managers like play tricks with me like to try and get me all stoked about things all my life. And uh, it never worked on me, so I don't know why I thought it would work on other people. It's like management virus, it just takes over your brain. <sighs> so what we need is excellent teams. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the Dora report that is interesting and useful. And if you haven't read it, everyone should read it. Observability. <coughs> is the technical prerequisite that most people are missing. Now, it's not the only stumbling block. It, like, there are a lot of things, but they tend to be on the social and like, team side. Like, the, the thing, it's like a two-phase like two system, right? Like, like, the, like with a car, where you have to let off the brake and push on the gas, right? You have to like, remove the things that are keeping people from being high performers, and then you have to like, add things that, to help them. And, and the one that is holding most people back on the technical side is observability, because they're driving around with blindfolds on. Like they're literally just like shipping code, leaving, <laughs> never looking at it, never instrumenting, not having a tight feedback loop there of, you know, I'm building something. Um, I'm not gonna accept a code review unless I can explain how I will know if it breaks, right? Like that should be, if it passes your tests, cool. Now how are you gonna know if it breaks? Like, that is just as important. And if you're not instrumenting to ask and answer that question every single day, if you're not like up to your elbows in your, your telemetry every day, then you don't know your systems. If you only look at your systems when they're broken, you don't know your systems. Like if you only have monitoring checks, you don't know your systems. And you're going to be, you're going to be lost when it comes to anything that's actually new and hard, which is a problem because there's more and more new and hard stuff coming for all of us. Um, production excellence, like I feel like every team has a dual mandate, right? Make your customers happy, but making your team is ha is happy is just as important. And whenever people leave that off, I get wary. Um, I don't even give a shit, like if it's like, in the service of making happier customers, we need to have low to turnover, blah, 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 blah. That's fine, if that's what motivates people, but like paying attention to the team's happiness has real, like measurable impact on all of us, right? Our ability to do our jobs well, our ability to sustain it, our ability to not get burned out, our ability to build good systems. And, <laughs> and we do have to see, be able to see where we're going. Uh, that's what I just said. Um, because 
Like, we've kind of gotten along for a long time with this very hacky sort of like dashboard and intuition approach. And like, believe me, I loved playing God as much as anyone. Like, I was always super good. I could just look at the dashboard and like go, ha, it's Redis. <laughs> I know it doesn't say Redis anywhere on that. Trust me, it's Redis. Like, it feels so good. I feel so good about myself. <laughs> uh, uh, because like I had like this infinitely long library of past outages that had cre created scar tissue and it would just tickle something in my brain, you know? And I love that feeling. But when I was at Parse, the job before Honeycomb, uh, I, I saw what happened when I ran out of scenarios, right? When most of the problems that I was encountering were not known unknowns that I could pattern match, but they were unknown unknowns that I'd never seen before, might never see again. And so I had to figure them out from scratch every time. Uh, and like, I draw this graph sort of tongue in cheek because I'm a music major dropout and that's funny to me. Um, <laughs> but complexity is going up. And if we look at some architecture diagrams, like you've got the humble lamp stack. And I feel obligated to say, if you can solve your problems with a lamp stack, please do, <laughs> for all of our sakes. In the middle, that's Parse um, a few years ago. Um, the middle blob there is a few hundred MongoDB replica sets, <laughs> all with a single right lock. <laughs> Good times. Uh, and, and that one on the right is uh, the National Electrical Grid. Um, and when we're thinking about building software architecture in the future, the model that we really need to have fixed in our minds is that of the electrical grid. Uh, when we're planning for failures and resiliency and all this stuff, because uh, you know, with the lamp stack, it's like, okay, I'm spinning up this lamp stack. I can look at it, size it up, predict 80% of the problems I will ever have. So I'm just going to like roll out a bunch of monitoring checks, you know, disk space, uh, number of HTTP workers, uh, you know, yeah, you know. Uh, and then over the course of the next few months, I'll burn in the rest, the ones that I couldn't anticipate. And then it's a pretty stable set. Maybe once or twice a year, I'll be super stumped. Maybe, right? It's a very secure feeling. Um, with a national electrical grid, you would be a fool to try and sit there and predict the waves it's going to break, which tree is going to fall over on which street in which town today. Uh, you know, it's, it's chaos, it's anarchy. Like, the, all the time you spend trying to predict what's going to happen and, like, account for it is just wasted time. Uh, you know, some problems are going to be hyper-local. Like, you know, there's a flash flood in, you know, some small town in Southern California. Some problems you can only see if you zoom way in like that. Some problems you can only see if you zoom way out and look at it, you know, from a thousand, thousand yards. Like, if all of the components that were manufactured in 1997 are rusting ten times as fast, you know, because it had an off year or something. Or if, you know, a particular build ID for some, you know, it, it, there are so many variables that go into this, and they're all high cardinality, and they're all full of chaos. So you just have to like lean into it. Just be like, all right, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> I'm from Idaho. Uh, but like, instead of trying to like control outcomes, I'm gonna focus on instrumenting and understanding what's happening while it's happening, so that if I start getting reports that you know some people have lost power, I can very quickly like slice and dice and zoom in. Ah. It's somewhere in this area, right? Send a truck there. Uh, and it looks like this type, right? Uh, instrumentation, rapid response, and the ability, it's, it's a more flexible, it's more open-ended, it's more exploratory type of approach. And it's a, real, it's a real releasing of any illusion of control. And this is a, mind, this is a mindset that once you've made the shift, I, fi I find it delightful. Um, because you get to make a lot of jokes about failure and scare people. And, and honestly, it does feel, once, once you realize that you were never really safe to begin with, you just thought you were, you know, you can feel, you can sleep at night. I'm not, I'm really selling this, aren't I? Uh, let's move on. <laughs> we are really bad at understanding our systems. And, and this is in large part because um, the tools that we've had have been really for capturing those known unknowns, making it so that no outage is wasted, right? Like the day after a big outage, what do we do? We call a postmortem, and we do the blameless retro, right? And we make a big list of all these things that we could roll out and fix and change so that it doesn't happen next time, and so that when it happens the next time, we have a dashboard that shows exactly what's happening, we'll jump straight to it, and there'll be the monitoring check, you know, 
all of this illusion of control. It feels delicious. Um, and for a long time, it worked really well, right? The run books that we would amass, we had a lot of confidence in those run books. Um, <laughs> they're kind of used, they're kindling now. Run books are basically kindling now. Uh, because this parallel is a shift from you know, known unknowns to unknown unknowns um, because of the, the, the size and the dynamism and the uh, ephemeral nature of so much of today's infrastructure. Uh, most of today's infrastructure, you don't even run. My ops people all work for AWS, <laughs> which is great, by the way. Um, but this parallel is a shift from monitoring to observability. Uh, and I know that this is somewhat controversial, but everyone else is wrong and I'm right. <laughs> That's not necessarily true. Um, I, um, I think that the ways that I try to define these words uh, are the ways that I think are the most useful and differentiating um, so that we can reason about it in a technical sense and make, and make arguments for why we are doing something rather than another thing. Um, specificity is, is very valuable, I think. Um, observability is not seen with monitoring. I, there was this great tweet that I just, it was this morning, so I just had to include it. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Monitoring is the action of observing and checking the behavior and outputs of a system and its components over time. Um, this is Gregory. He, he gave this talk called Monitoring is Dead, talking about how like archaic and outdated it was. Um, I love quoting his talk because he then went and became the VP of engineering at a monitoring company and he hates it when I show these slides. <laughs> so if monitoring's dead, like the question he kind of left un unasked or unanswered, and this is 2015 or 2016, was what's next? If our software is now large distributed systems made up of many non-uniform interacting components, um, well, this is where, like, when I Googled the, the definition of observability and I read the control theory definition, um, light bulb just kind of went off in my brain. I'm just like, Fuck, this is what we're trying to do. Like, this is the difference between, you know, I mean, the origin story of Honeycomb was that was, I was at Parse, right? And we had about a million mobile apps running on it. It was like Heroku for mobile. And every day someone would come to me and be like, Parse is down! You know, eh, angst, angst. Um, maybe it's Disney, right? They're doing like four requests per second, but those are very precious four requests per second. Um, but because I'm doing 100,000 requests per second, it would never show up in any of my time series databases. Never show up in any of my aggregates. So I'd be like, ah, Parse is not down. Behold, my wall full of dashboards, they're all green. Um, but I believe you when you say that it's not working for you, so let me go figure out what's wrong. And it would take hours, if not days, sometimes it was literally impossible to do um, because we were running a large distributed system with many co-tenancy like, points where it would be sharing some piece of hardware with a million other apps. And if they, any of those apps did something wonky, everyone was screwed. So I tried everything. Man, I, I was like, I, I, we were down every day and it was really scary and depressing and hard. And I tried every tool out there. And the, the first thing to like bring some relief, the, the thing that we ended up building towards and doubling down on was this, any, any Facebook people here? Yes, okay. This, this butt ugly, aggressively hostile to users tool called Scuba. Like it's just like, it did one thing and one thing really well, which is it let you slice and dice on in near real time on dimensions of arbitrarily high cardinality. Um, everything else, oh my God, it was so hard to use. But we started shipping some data sets in there, and the time it took us to understand and diagnose these very specific problems just dropped like a rock, like from days to like seconds. And like predictably, like every time. It wasn't even an engineering problem anymore, it was just a support problem, just like slice and dice, figure out what was wrong. Because it would let you do things like, uh, uh, you know, you get a vague report, you know, if something is wrong, you know, so you just slice and dice. And, okay, let's look for errors, break down by endpoint which endpoints have the highest error rates. Uh, it looks like it's the right endpoints. Okay, is it all of the right endpoints that are erring? No, it's just these. Well, what do they have in common? Or is it all of them that are erring? No, it's just, you know, shipping to these availability zones or these primaries or this instance type or, you know, and, and you could just follow the trail of breadcrumbs just like, oh, it's that, right? And this, like, honestly, I'm in ops. I was just like so grateful to have it fixed. I was on to the next thing. I didn't even really stop to think about 
what it was or why. It was just a magical tool that solved all my problems. Until I left Facebook and I was planning to work at Slack or Stripe or something. And, and that's when I kind of screeched to a halt and went, oh no, shit. I don't know how to engineer anymore without this stuff that we've built here. Like, it's become so core and so fundamental to how I, um, how I everything. Like, it's one of my five, it's one of my, it's my sixth sense, right? It's, it's, it's as core to how I, it's as core as like being able to type. Like, it's how I know what's happening. It's how I decide what I'm going to work on. It's how I have any confidence that what I'm doing is, you know, it's just, it's, it's so ingrained into everything that I do that the idea of going back to monitoring <laughs> It, it's terribly bad for my ego. Like, I cannot go back to being that bad of an engineer. Uh, that's not a flattering thing to say, but it's actually pretty true. I was just like, I, I, I can't be a bad engineer. I, I felt like I was a bad engineer. Um, so, in retrospect, I realized that what I had was observability. <laughs> the ability to look at a system and figure out what the internal state was without having any information about it, without, um, shipping any custom code to handle it. Because if you have to like ship code to understand what's going on, that means you needed to predict what was going on in order to know what to ship. And you get caught in this really like annoying circular logic thing. So like observability for software engineers is just that. Can you understand what's happening inside your systems just by asking questions from the outside? Can you debug your code and its behavior using its output? Can you tell, this is not about debugging lines of code, but it's about telling where in the system is the code that you need to debug. Um, and can you do it without shipping new code? You have an observable system when your team can just churn these out, like swiftly, when it's no longer a source of friction or, or, or concern, you know? And, and, and what you'll realize is, is just how much of your time gets chewed up in not doing work, but trying to figure out what work to do, or doing the wrong work, or, you know, it's, it's really amazing. Um, it's also a perspective shift. Monitoring is very much a third part person observer, like checking up, like, how's it going? How's it going? Right? Observability is about getting inside the code and ha having it explain itself out to you. There are a lot of things that follow from this very simple definition, like, um, high cardinality follows from that definition. Like, it must be based on events. It must, it must have um, some sense of ordering, traceability. It must, it can't be done with metrics because metrics have tossed away all of that connective tissue of the event before they even write things down in the beginning. It cannot do anything with pre-aggregated. You cannot have observability with pre-aggregated data. You must have the ability to just get all the way to the raw events, because if you can't get to the raw events, you can't ask new questions. You can only ask the questions that you canned up front. Our tools have been designed for a predictable world, and this clash is, is, is what's causing a lot of our heartache right now. Um, <laughs> the system is never actually up, which is kind of the flip side of the uh, electrical system. So, in summary, I have a couple summary slides here, and then I have a couple, just a little bit to tie, tie the streams back together and talk about how you get to having a high, you know, performing team using observability. Um, but, like, here are some of the things, and I am to I'm not, like, trying to be, like, Moses on the mountaintop going, these things are observability. It's just that I've been working on this problem for four fucking years. <laughs> and, and these are the things that we've discovered. And some people are like, you're just saying that's because this is what Honeycomb does. And I'm like, no, it's the other way around. Honeycomb does this <laughs> because that's what's required to solve this problem. Um, but I think that we're early on in figuring out what observability is and what the actual, what all of the consequences and the side effects and the implications are. Um, I, like, I would love to have a healthy argument about any of these if people have strong opinions. And I believe that there's a lot left to be discovered that probably won't come from me because I am tired. <laughs> Um, I, I, I like that observability um, is so aligned with the end user's experience, right? Which is a shift from monitoring is traditionally about the health of the service, right? The health of RabbitMQ, the health of the database, the health of whatever. And observability is about, it's from the perspective of the request as it makes its way through your code, right? Observability is, oh, well, let me see my shirt. <laughs> Nines don't matter, right? Doesn't matter how perfect your infrastructure is if your users can't get to it or can't use it or, or if there's something there that is preventing them from actually getting what they need to out of it. 
And I like that. I've always felt like Ops was the uh, engineering um, org that was most aligned with users. So, uh, observability is not comprised of vendors. <laughs> vendors? Pillars. <laughs> Private pillars or vendors, doable pre aggregation, doable without tracing, or exclusively without tracing, etc. So I have a couple of just like quick. I have 15 minutes left. Uh, quick, uh, we're doing a lot of talking around the problem, but I think it's helpful to just walk through uh, the problem itself so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So here is an example problem. Photos are loading slowly for some people, not everyone. Some people. Every single one of you has debugged this, <laughs> this problem at some point. Um, from a LAMP stack, what are some answers? Well, here are some things that could be a problem. These are great things to monitor for. Uh, now let's look at the same problem, but all of these scenarios were taken from real scenarios at Instagram and Parse. Monitor for, I'm not quite sure what to monitor for. Let's look at a few more. I know what you're thinking, it is not a cron job. <laughs> Historical mean on Tuesdays. Um, I could do this basically all, all night. <laughs> I think that that Romania outage is maybe my favorite one ever. They're like, pushes down. I'm like, pushes not down. Like, I'm getting pushes and it's in a queue. Ergo, push cannot be down. And they're just very upset. Like, for days, pushes down. I'm like, fine, I'll go take a look. Um, and eventually, much later, I found that, um, so Android devices used to need to hold a socket open to like subscribe to pushes at all times. I don't know if it's still true. Um, so we would like, <laughs> we had tuned a VM to like, hold a million connections open and we put it in an auto scaling group and we just like, you know, it would auto scale itself up whenever it needed more capacity. And it had done this. Cool. It added more capacity. Um, we were round robin DNSing him. Um, so this time when we added capacity, it, um, the DNS response exceeded the EP packet size, which is fine, right? It's supposed to fail over to DCP, which it did everywhere in the world <laughs> except for one router in Romania. Again, I ask you, what the fuck am I supposed to monitor for? <laughs> uh, you can't, right? You just have to lean in and embrace it. Like, most of the problems that you need to worry about for the rest of your life, you will never be able to predict. That's why they're fun. <laughs> Welcome to distributed systems, basically. So uh, to like kind of refresh, just like I want to underline here are some technical aspects and cultural associations with the LAMP stack. And I think it's fascinating to look at how you can kind of see ways in which the technical fundamentals, I'm not like super prescriptivist about this, but it has informed some of the cultural things that we have. Like the, the, the paranoia about devs being on prod. They're just like, you shall not pass. You know, devs cannot be trusted. Well, it was a really pretty fragile system, right? You had one binary, and it was up or it was down for the most part, and and you know, and so it, and and we ha and we didn't see unknown unknown problems all the time. It was a pretty fixed, you know, set of things that would break. So, you know, we kind of <laughs> crafted this very like elaborate glass castle around it. We're just like nobody touch anything, <laughs> and and like we paged the shit out of ourselves. Sorry, I keep swearing. It's just kind of who I am. Uh, I, many monitoring checks, many paging alerts, because it's like, you know, we'd find a, a threshold, we're like, mm, this is good, let's check for this, right? And, but deploys are always going to be scary. If you've got one big monolith, two deploys are the entire world, right? It's harder to gracefully degrade those. Uh, so we debugged by intuition, we feared production, we had a very masochistic on call culture. <laughs> Guilty. Um, and I think of this as like this, last castle. And, you know, we did the best we could with what we had at the time. But there are a lot of ways that we can do better. This, this, this last castle was very hostile to a lot of people. Um, even to us. <laughs> it was very, um, 
it was very scary to explore and experiment with it. And uh, so let's look at distributed systems, like technical aspects and some of the cultural associations. Like the keyword here is many, <laughs> many storage systems. Like not the database and the app, but like many databases. Everybody's a DBA. Woo! Many services. Every time you get paged, it should be something you don't know. Like you should never be going, oh that again, oh that again. Like we fix those, right? Every time you get paged, it should be something genuinely novel. Like, huh? <laughs> Guess that's worth getting paged about, right? Um. And because of that, like the rate of, of, of gaining paging alerts was really unsustainable and so we've radically reduced them, right? We have thrown away almost all of our paging alerts on very high performing teams and you just, you know, you have your SLOs, you have the big three, arguably four, but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> sorry, I get dogmatic when I'm sleepy. Um, and because there are so many more ways to fail, like we've, we've really, like they've become our friends and you know, failures are your friends. Production, you know, is, it is not scary to fail. We have had to find ways to make it not scary to fail. Deploys are opportunities. Uh, and, and, I, and I love that, I, I feel like we're seeing as we like open the doors wider, you know, like a playground, right? We've gone from the glass castle to, to we're building a playground with like bumpers so that, you know, we're not, you know, we might split our lip, but we're not gonna just die at the playground, right? Like, we, we build in these guardrails to like keep us more or less safe so you can send your kids there or something. Uh, and we make it so that people who, who build it are expected to be there, right? We make it safer for everyone, everyone because we recognize that so much of improving our systems um, means we have to welcome in experimentation. Uh, it has to be human scale, it has to welcome, it has to be built for the expectation that we are going to make mistakes and they're just not, aren't gonna be that catastrophic. And I like this, like this, when I'm feeling like scared and sad and down about the universe or whatever, like I think that there's some real reasons to hope here. I, th I think that our culture as, a, as an industry has gotten immeasurably better over the past decade or so. And I think that the technical trends, um, are supporting us in this transformation. I really do. I think that it's it's really about democratizing access. It's about making it you know empowering individuals, um, engineers of all sorts, even non-engineers. Like the engineering adjacent uh, teams should be knee deep in production every day too, because it's where your job is. And 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 we have to, right? Like I feel like the dirty little secret that even the most hard nosed managers have started to realize is that, like. <laughs> They've gotten too hard for people to just clock in, work with half their brain, and leave for the day. Like, systems are too hard now. They require, they need a team who is passionate, who is engaged, who is using their full creative brain and energy to engage with the problems at hand. Uh, I, and I feel very confident that like, the next generation of systems are not going to be built and run by burned out people. Or by command and control teams who are just following orders and not that engaged. You know, you, you, you should feel like a co-owner of your, of your system. Dan Pink's saying, what, it's like aut autonomy, uh, mastery, and uh, purpose. purpose. Thank you. Right, don't work on shitty projects. <laughs> if, if your company shouldn't exist in the world, leave it. No shame, I've been at one of those. Two of those. Three of those? <laughs> about done. Our tools are designed for a very predictable world. Uh, we have tools that let us ask questions and get answers really fast. Um, but increasingly I find that um, the problem is that I don't know what the question is, right? And, and I need tools that help me figure out what questions to ask and that have a kind of constant conversation with me about what I'm seeing and experiencing. Uh, I think that you know, I kind of, I, I, I think that I shy away from pushing on this one too hard because I think that all of you are suffering for lack of observability, but I'm also like, well, I'm a vendor. They're just gonna be like, whatever, Charity. So, you know, but like, I, I think that the teams that have proper tools are, are, are really out competing the people who, like, and this shows up, <laughs> and you can see why, because there is like these competing like motivations here, but like, the teams that get really big, you know, and managers tend to like to hire people so they don't push back as much as they should, but like, you know, 
a small team of engineers that doesn't have a lot of shit work can get a lot done. Uh, large teams that have a lot of shit work can get less done. It's a competitive advantage. Our systems are emergent and unpredictable. Um, Observability leads to high performing teams in, in these. Like we wrote up a, if you haven't read our maturity model, you should totally just go give it a read. I'm just gonna skip right through it here because it's kind of boring and I'm kind of out of time. Uh, but like we identified these, these five ways like that, that they really describe the gap between where teams are now and like where we all want to be. And, and we, we like wrote up some stuff like how you, because everybody's path is unique, so we wrote up some stuff that'll help you identify like which one of these are your weakest and you know, how observability helps. And it's, you know, taking off the blindfold does actually let you hit that pinata much harder. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, and if you're like, I don't have time, well, <laughs> you kind of don't have time not to. Um, you're wasting a lot of time. Anyway, uh, engineering quality of life is tightly linked to high performing teams. This is not just about boasting rights, this is not just about, you know, you know, some elitist thing. Like this is like you saw that <laughs> that scary list of like numbers, right? This this is pain that is measured in sleepless nights, in frustrated people, in people who are burned out, who are disconnected from their work, who are just want to get home at the end of the day. That's not the fun, creative, like engaging, thrilling part of engineering that got us all into this. And, 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 and like it can be such a wonderful, happy job that I just, uh, it would be so much better. It's also a prerequisite for other modern things like chaos engineering, sane deploys, deploys on Friday, like everyone should deploy, <laughs> sorry. Test, testing and production and other modern best practices. Where are we going? Well, in the end, on-call will be shared by everyone. But the flip side of that, management's responsibility is that on-call must not be miserable. You cannot ask everyone to be on-call if you aren't equally committed to like taking time away from the product roadmap to pay down that debt, make it so that people are not getting woken up. Uh, it's, it's not reasonable to expect people to just like prop up these sagging, dirty systems indefinitely. Fix it or quit. <laughs> I, I, I like to think of it as like on call should be less like a heart attack and more like a dentist visit. <laughs> it's not the worst thing. It's not going to ruin your week or your month. You don't really have to plan for it. Um, but it's not maybe the. Honestly, I think that we should be. I think that people should be able to look forward to on call week. You know, if like our our kids get woken up about once a year, right? They almost never get paged out it, but they but they look forward to on call week because that's a week they can get they can work on whatever it is that's bugging them about our code base that is not technically what they have been assigned to do. And they can just go fix things and it's liberating and it's fun and there are little rebellious little shits about it, but it's great. It's great. It's fully great. Serverless is a harbinger, like when you're thinking about how should instrumentation look five years from now, just look at what serverless is doing now. That's how everyone should be instrumenting. Invest in your deploys. Every single one of you has not invested nearly enough engineering effort into your deploys. I would bet a lot of whiskey on that. Build your dives a playground, build guardrails so that they don't die. Encourage curiosity and ownership. Don't punish. Everyone get up to your elbows and prod every day. Practice small failures. And senior engineers, like the, the thing that I've been realizing lately is just how much our jobs, our job is to amplify the hidden costs. Our job is, you know, we're always like wandering around just like mumbling and like rah, 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 this isn't, you know, they're not making a bad decision because rah, rah, rah. well, they're doing their best with the information that they have. Probably the information that's in our head would be very useful to them if they're making a decision that is not the one that we agree. And, and this is the thing that took me years to learn, it's not enough to say it once. Sadly, it should be, I agree with you, but it's not. People forget, people need to be reminded. If it's important, we have to say it over and over and over and over again, be a little annoying about it sometimes and so that people make the right decisions. In conclusion, and your engineering org has two constituencies, your users and your team. Now it doesn't matter if users are not happy, but you're not gonna have a great system if your team isn't happy. So I think we have an opportunity here. The stars are aligning, technical gods are on our side to make things a lot better, so we should do it. Thanks. So would you say that um, 
since you have known and unknowns, that for the knowns, you still need to focus on monitoring and have maturity there before you move to observability? There's always going to be a role for monitoring. Absolutely. I think of it like your test suite, right? You run tests every time. You don't want to get regressions. You want to make sure that, you know, the stuff, the ground that you've already made, you keep. And I think monitoring is very much the same. And it's a mature, you know, and I say mature like this is a good thing. We know how to do it. We should do it. Like, um, the implementation details, you know, there is fuzziness. There's overlap. You know, you can, you can do monitoring with observability tools sometimes, and it's much harder to do observability with monitoring tools, but it's all data, and systems can usually, you can usually ask a question more than one way, right? So, does that answer your question? It does. Um, are, do you recommend any good books on observability or resources? So, Liz and I are writing one right now, <laughs> uh, and I'm late <laughs> for my part. Uh, but, <laughs> Um, other than that, like, it's really, it's pretty young, so there really aren't any good books that I know of. Um, uh, two exceptions. Uh, you can really look at distributed tracing as being, you know, the bottoms up observability. Um, because traces are just events, right? Events are just traces, spans. Um, so you can get a lot just out of, like, reading stuff on distributed tracing. Um, and there's a collection of pretty good white papers on the Honeycomb site where we've been, they're pretty vendor agnostic. They're about everything from the technical stuff to the culture stuff. Um, and I've heard from people that, that that is useful. Hi, wonderful talk. Thank um, you, Bridget. If you were going to uh, tell people to go home and change one thing after what they've heard here today. Delete all your alerts. <laughs> and add them back one by one as you find that they're actually really necessary. But I'm betting that over half of them won't be. All right, I'm going to put the stickers down there. Don't forget, converge, unicorns. Four-year-olds love them. <laughs> <laughs>